Hello everyone. In this video, we will discuss the poem "Ode on a Grecian Urn" written by John Keats. John Keats is one of the Romantic poets, and he is a poet who died very young. He was only twenty-five years old when he died. Now, uh, looking into the life of John Keats, we understand that his life was full of sufferings and loss. Keats lost both his parents when he was very young. His mother had tuberculosis, so did his brother, and Keats himself was suffering from tuberculosis, and he died at the age of twenty-five. So Keats lived a life of melancholy. Even his poems keeps reminding us that we are only mortals, and that our time on this earth is very short. And Keats always portrays his pain, his sufferings, his agony in his poems. Before moving into the poem, let's talk about the inspiration that made Keats write this poem. So this happened when Keats read a few articles which were written by Benjamin Hayden, and these articles were about the Elgin marbles. Elgin marbles is a term we use for sculptures which were brought to Britain from Greece by Lord Elgin. So Lord Elgin he wanted to bring these sculptures to Britain in order to make a museum. The stories that he says is that he has taken permission from the he took permission from the authority of Greece in order to take these sculptures. But we do not know the story is has a lot of disputed versions. So anyway, he bought all these sculptures and it is kept in the British Museum. And there are some articles written about these Elgin marbles by Benjamin Hayden. And John Keats came across this. He read these and he got inspired to write the poem "Ode on a Grecian Urn." And thus he wrote the poem. In eighteen nineteen, Keats published this poem anonymously in Annals of the Fine Arts. This year, eighteen nineteen, was a very productive year for Keats. This was after the period of death of his brother and mother. and he had gone through a lot of sufferings personally so this spirit comes after all these sufferings and it was a very productive period and all these odes like ode to a grecian urn ode to a nightingale ode on melancholy all these odes were written during these times coming to the title of the poem this is an ode ode is a poem that is addressed to a person or a thing so here the poem is addressed to the grecian urn now urn in earlier days urns were these containers in which ashes of the dead people were kept and these urns would be decorated with beautiful pictures so john keats come across one such urn and it was a grecian urn it was one of the urns from greece we talked about elgin marbles and the articles written by benjamin so it was one of those it could be one of those urns and thus the title ode on a grecian urn ekphrasis is the technique used by keats in this poem that is keats is writing a poem about another piece of art okay grecian urn is already an art it is made by an artist now based on this art keats is preparing another art so a poetic representation of an art art about art is called ekphrasis now let's move into the poem though still unravished bride of quietness though foster child of silence and slow time see since this is an ode i told you an ode is a poem in which the poet addresses a person or a thing so here what is addressed is the urn the poet is directly talking to the urn so the poet says though though meaning you you still unravished bride of quietness the poet calls the urn the bride of quietness why is the urn called bride of quietness it's because the urn never speaks it is only a sculpture it can never speak it never makes any noise it's always quiet so it is called the bride of quietness and why is it unravished unravished means untouched which is very pure it is not yet married it is only bride 
it is very pure and innocent and it's going to be married to quietness bride of quietness though foster child of silence and slow time not only he calls the urn the bride of quietness he is also calling the urn foster child of silence and slow time silence we just told now the urn is always quiet and why slow time slow time because the urn is a piece of art it is never going to be destroyed by time we humans we are mortals as time passes we change and one day we will be no more but the urn the time time never destroys the urn even after many years the urn still manages to remain as it is so according to keats usually what time does is time destroys everything time destroys youth time destroys childhood it all passes away with time but in the case of this urn time is preserving the urn without destroying it so that is why the poet calls the urn foster child of silence and slow time now why foster child because silence and slow time did not make this urn the urn was made by an artist a sculptor and it is being preserved taken care by these two that is why foster child sylvian historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme now again the urn is called a sylvian historian it's because the urn has all these decorations i told you the urn carries ashes and the urn is decorated with all these pictures outside so it's it's like the urn is telling us stories like he is a historian and he is telling us stories of the past sylvan means pastoral so the pictures on the urn is related to a pastoral setting so the urn seems to be a historian who is telling stories about the pastoral life and according to keats this urn can tell stories he can express stories even better than rhyme which means poetry the urn can express the tale the stories more sweetly much better than our poems our rhymes and then keats mentions he asks a lot of questions to the urn and from this questions we understand what are these pictures there is a reason there should be a reason why he is called a sylvan historian the urn is called a sylvan historian so what are the reasons what type of pictures are there on the urn this we understand from the questions that follow first he asks what leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape that is there is this legend a story that is carved the urn is decorated with a story and there are a lot of leaves and trees and greenery it's a pastoral setting so what is the story all all about what story has been etched on to you of deities or mortals or of both is it about is it a story about deities gods or mortals human beings or is it about both in tembe or in the dales of arcady so these are the places in greece so is the story taking place in tembe or is it taking place in the dales of arcady what men or gods are these who are these people what maidens loath now the maiden the young women they seem to be hating something they are unwilling towards something so what is it that they are hating so much what mad pursuit what is all this chasing what is going on all over you what struggle to escape what pipes and timbrels so there are all these musical instruments what wild ecstasy so a lot is happening on the urn what is happening what what is this energy all about what is this excitement all about what is the story all about the poet wants to know and then the second stanza begins with the line heard melodies are sweet but those unheard are sweeter now this is a very famous line and keats what keats means is heard melodies are sweet if you have heard a beautiful song if there is a song that you really like uh, that tune would be very sweet to you it would be a very beautiful song to you but the songs that you have not heard 
if your uh, friend comes and tells you that there is the song in this movie and it's super you will actually like it very much i can't stop listening to it even though you have not listened to the song you would feel that the song is actually very beautiful the same way the poet feels that the melodies the music that have been already heard are sweet but those that are unheard which we have not heard they are even more sweeter therefore ye soft pipes play on so there is this remember in the last stanza uh, keith talks about pipes and timbrels the musical instruments so he is telling the soft pipes the one who is playing the pipes to keep playing on because your music is something that we couldn't hear but keith strongly believe that he is playing a very beautiful song so play on not to the sensual ear but more endeared so your song will be loved not by our physical ear we cannot hear your song with our physical ear but it is more endeared more loved by something that is more precious and what is that pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone and your music is going to appeal to our spirit our soul not simply to our ear but our soul and ditties means songs symbol songs so ditties of no tone again no tone because we can't hear and then he says fair youth beneath the trees so on the urn there is this picture of a fair youth a beautiful young man who is sitting beneath the trees thou canst not leave thy song now don't stop the song you can't nor ever can those trees be bare your song will be never stopped nor will those trees be ever bare the leaves on the trees will be always there it will never fall down whatever the season may be that tree is going to be full of leaves all the time your song is going to be heard forever and then maybe he was going through the pictures on the urn and he saw this next person first he saw the fair youth and now he saw a lover a bold lover he calls him bold lover never never canst thou kiss thou winning near the goal yet do not grieve now he sees that there is this lover he is trying very hard to kiss a girl and what he sees is that he has not reached his goal yet goal is the woman he has not reached the goal yet and poet is telling the bold lover see you are never ever going to kiss that girl you are etched you are carved on this urn you will never reach that woman never never and he's repeating the words never in this lifetime never forever you are going to stay there never never canst thou kiss though winning near the goal yet even though you are very close you can never kiss this girl do not grieve but don't worry don't be sad why she cannot fade even though you cannot kiss her this girl is never going to fade even she will remain there forever though thou hast not thy bliss forever wilt thou love and she be fair even though you couldn't kiss her like you wanted to what is the positive side on the bright side forever you will love her you can keep loving her forever and she will be always fair fair meaning she will be always young she is not going to get old she will be always young she will be always fair and beautiful and you can keep loving her forever and the next stanza begins with the line a ah, happy happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves so the boughs branches are very happy according to keats because they never have to shed their leaves whatever the season it is the boughs are always going to be full of leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu it is going to be always spring for you it is never going to be winter it's never going to be monsoon it's never going to be hot summer it's always going to be spring for you you do not have to adieu is to say goodbye you never have to say goodbye to spring and happy melodies unwearied forever piping songs forever new now you happy melodies there is a person who is playing melodies you are also very happy why because his poems are going to be always new 
nobody is going to hear your songs so your poems will never get old they are always going to be new more happy love more happy happy love forever warm and still to be enjoyed now whatever love was being portrayed on this earth even that love is very happy because this love is forever going to be warm forever they are going to be excited the person who is running behind this maiden the young lady to kiss he is never going to get tired of her he has never kissed her he will be always excited to kiss her so this love will be always warm and still to be enjoyed forever panting and forever young you will be forever enjoying each other's company and you will be forever young all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue so there is this human passion which is far above the normal what we enjoy or experience let's talk about this fair youth we talked about who was chasing this woman if these both the youth and the girl they both were people of real life if this boy went and approached the girl he would be either rejected or the other chances that he would get accepted and if he gets rejected he would have this pain the heart throbbing pain he would be sorrowful he would have this burning forehead parching tongue he would have this pain of being rejected and what if he gets accepted if he gets accepted then they both might have some moments of exciting uh, experiences but other than that they slowly start to lose interest in each other with time so even if the person gets rejected or he gets accepted in real life it's both going to lead to the same thing the sorrows and the burning forehead and the parching tongue all this is possible in real life but on this earth he is never going to get accepted or never going to get rejected forever the excitement is going to be there in this chase they will be always young their love is going to be always warm and they will always enjoy so in this stanza you can see the word happy being repeated a lot oh happy happy boss happy melodist happy love a lot of times the word happy is being repeated happy happy love okay so here keats is trying to point out the permanence of art that is art is never going to get destroyed with time art is permanent and on the other side you can also see this as keats trying to show us the mortality of human life when you compare art to human life in a way keats might keats might be also showing her sadness of losing her uh, brother uh, his family members through these lines that how lucky you are how lucky these pictures on the urn is because they never have to lose anything whatever there is on the urn is going to stay the same forever so this idea of permanence of art could be seen in the stanza and then maybe the poet has turned the urn to the other side and he sees the other side there are decorations and the paintings carvings on the other side who are these coming to the sacrifice so maybe there is a sacrifice and a lot of people are going for it so who are these coming to the sacrifice to what green altar oh mysterious priest let's though that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed so the poet sees that a lot of people are going somewhere and he is guessing that maybe they are going for a sacrifice and there is also a priest a mysterious priest we do not know of what kind from where he is from uh, so he is a mysterious priest and there um, he is guessing that they are all going to a green altar and then he sees a heifer heifer is a calf a cow so there is this heifer he is lowing at the skies lowing is to make a sound crying he is looking at the skies and crying maybe um, the animal is being carried for the sacrifice 
and all his silicon flanks with garlands dressed so this animal who is taking who is being taken for the sacrifice is decorated with all these silicon flanks and garlands flowers and uh, clothes it is well decorated and taken for the sacrifice and there is this priest along with this uh, heifer what little town by river or sea shore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pious mon and then the poet wonders now where are these people coming from if these people have to go to the sacrifice they might be coming from somewhere so where are they coming from what little town by the river are they coming from a little town which is near to a river or by the sea shore or they are are they coming from a mountain built with peaceful citadel Uh, are they coming from a mountain where there is a peaceful citadel, small church? Is emptied of this folk. Where are they coming from? Where are these folk, these people coming from? This pious morning, this sacred morn, morn is morning. So this early morning, where are these people all coming from? And Keith says, and little town, the town from where these people have come, thy streets for ever more will silent be. now don't expect these people to come back they are never going to come back forever they will be on this earth here and they are not going to come back to you and your streets will be forever silent and not a soul to tell why though art desolate there won't be a single person in the town to tell others the other travelers who come to the t- town when they ask where these people are there should be one or two people to tell where these people have gone but there won't be any people in this town anymore because they are all here so not a soul to tell why thou art desolate desolate is empty can ever return nobody will ever return to tell others where all these people have gone and then he says we come to the last chance o oh, attic shape fair attitude with braid of marble men and maidens over wrote so o oh, attic shape this is something that is very old antique attic attic shape fair attitude fair because maybe it's made up of marbles we talked about elgin marbles so here fair may mean that this urn is actually made up of white marbles with braid decorated or embroidered of marble men and maidens over broad so you can find marble men men and maidens carved in the marble with forest branches and the trodden weed you can see the forest branches all over carved and there are also trodden weed weed on which uh, people have walked on trodden thou silent form again the poet is addressing the urn thou you silent form you are always silent always quiet dost these us out of thought as doth eternity now the poet seems to feel that the urn is teasing him and why does the urn tease him does these us out of thought as doth eternity the urn is going to be eternal the urn is going to stay the same forever we talked about permanence of art so it seems to the poet that urn is mocking at the poet the urn is mocking at the humans thinking that we are only mortals when the urn can live forever the same without any change in it so the poet calls it cold pastoral how cruel when somebody is Uh, when we see a person who doesn't show emotions who cannot show sympathy uh, who cannot be helpful we call that the, we say that the person is cold without any emotions always indifferent to sufferings so the poet is calling this urn cold pastoral cold pastoral because the poet told earlier that the urn has all these pastoral images on the urn and also he might be calling the urn cold pastoral because the urn is made out of marble so uh, it would be like since it is made out of marble it would be cold and then he says when old age shall this generation waste now according to keats 
this generation as humans we are going to get wasted how because with time with the passage of time we are all going to be old and with old age we will soon die so we are all going to get wasted in a way we will all get wasted thou shalt remain but who will remain the urn will remain in midst of other woe than ours a friend to man to whom thou sayest beauty is truth truth beauty that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know so we will get wasted our generation will become old we will die you will remain as you are and in midst of other woe than ours we will die you will remain here and then you will be able to see the other generations the coming generations and you will also witness their sufferings woe is suffering pain so you will see their pain not only ours than ours a friend to man just like how we sit here and admire you now you will be always a friend for the coming generations for man forever and to whom thou sayest and you will tell them when they come and look at you you will tell them beauty is truth truth beauty that is all you know on earth and all you need to know now very popular lines and still uh, we i don't know if we have still discovered the actual meaning that keats intended with these lines there are a lot of interpretations for these lines and i don't want to claim that my interpretation is right i'm just uh, putting it out for you you can judge you can tell me whether i am right or wrong about this so uh, what i understand is beauty is truth truth beauty uh, is that now see the urn urn is a piece of art it is something that stands for beauty now um, art is something that will last forever unlike humans or uh, unlike anything on this earth in the world art is something that can last forever the urn uh, the art is something that will last forever now we always say that truth is never going to change whatever the truth is truth will always remain the same so just like truth just like the permanence of truth the only other thing that can last without any change would be art so beauty here is referring to art it is referring to the permanence of art so beauty is truth art is the truth and truth beauty now what is beautiful about truth again that truth will always be permanent that it won't change that is the beauty of truth so beauty is truth and truth beauty that is all you know on earth that is all that you have to know on earth there is only if there is something that is permanent then that is only uh, art and also truth and that is the beauty about it also okay and all you need to know so uh, keats is trying to show the permanence of art that art is the only thing that will last and true beauty and truth they will last forever and here beauty refers to art beauty symbolizes art and this is the message that the urn is giving the coming generations the generations that will come and uh, adore it admire it after this generation has gone wasted by old age and that was the last chance of the poem and we have come to an end to it this poem could be thought of as an example for hellenism that is study of ancient greek cultures the grecian urn uh, it is one of the sculptures from greece so hellenism uh, could be mentioned when you write for your answer for the exam and when you learn this poem another important discussion that you should have is about this urn now in the beginning of our uh, video i told you that urn is this greek sculpture uh, completely embroidered uh, made very beautiful to store the ashes of the dead it is used to store the ashes of the dead now if you look at this urn the urn itself is a contradiction because see the urn itself is a work of art 
from outside it has all these carvings it is very beautiful and it is going to remain the same forever but inside the urn there are these remains of mortars uh, the remains of someone dead and that shows the mortality of human life which contrasts with the permanence of art and we can also think of it like this even though human life is fully vibrant we have happiness sadness uh, we celebrate life sometimes we have highs sometimes lows our life is so vibrant but it is temporary we are mortals but on the other hand again the urn is very cold without any emotions earlier remember keats called the urn uh, cold pastoral so the urn doesn't have any emotions it's always cold but it is immortal it is going to exist the same forever so the most prominent theme that keats is portraying through the poem is this contrast between the human life and art the temporariness of human life and the permanence of art and as you might have understood now that the poem is a sensuous poem keats is known to be a sensuous poet that is when you go through the poems written by keats it's, it's as if you can experience you actually experience what keats is uh, telling us through the poem in ode to a nightingale you can experience the flowers the scent of the flowers walking on the grass Uh, so the same way, even in this poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, when you read through the poem, it's as if you have actually seen the urn. You saw all these pictures on the urn. The uh, the boy who is sitting and uh, playing his pipe, this fair youth who is chasing this woman, the happy bows, and then the sacrifice, the procession uh, taking the calf. There is this priest. All these things, it's as if we have actually seen. So the poem is a sensuous poem. Keats has successfully uh, created the image of this Grecian urn in all our minds. And yes, Keats being a romantic poet, you can see elements of romanticism in the poem, like the pastoral setting, the negative capability, uh, Keats portraying beauty, and uh, the language used in the poem. All this shows that the poem is one of the examples of romantic poems. So with that we come to an end to this discussion. I hope you have understood the poem. It's a very beautiful poem. Actually, the poem was not seriously taken by the contemporaries of Keats. When the poem was published, it was not very popular. It was only after or uh, by the mid nineteenth century that the poem actually got its popularity and its claim. And as I mentioned earlier, eighteen nineteen is thought to be uh, the most productive period in the life of keats his uh, career and uh, this ode is thought to be one of the great odes of 1819 and if you look at the poem the structure of the poem you find that keats is asking a lot of questions there are a lot of questions actually there are more questions um, than answers or uh, explanations he ask about who are these people where are they going uh, from which town are they coming and why are these women running there are a lot of questions in the poem and even though uh, keith is asking too many questions from these questions we get a description of the urn so it's a very beautifully structured poem in a very unexpected way keith has structured it and yes it's very beautiful it's a very sensuous it's as if we get to see this urn and experience what keats is telling us through the poem so i hope i have given you a clear explanation and i hope you have understood please let me know your suggestions in the comment section and uh, i would like to know what you think is the interpretation of the line uh, beauty is truth truth beauty that is all you know on earth and all you need to know please let me know in the comment section that's all for today If you found this video useful please like share and subscribe thank you so much for watching